what do we have today? We talk about the dynamic zones and we compare them with the static zones and why dynamic zones are so awesome and so great. We talk about provisioning and how to update the dynamic zones and how dynamic zones somehow um, created Notify and the incremental zone transfer and all, how all that is related together. And like uh, last time, we have this time a hands-on session after the hour, which is completely optional. If you have time, you are welcome to take part of that. Uh, we have created a lot of virtual machines where you can log in, everyone gets uh, their own virtual machine and you can play around with dynamic zones and uh, experience them yourself. We will have two uh, FAQ parts or question and answers parts. One is behind, uh, af just after the uh, uh, presentation part and there's a second one then after the hands-on part. So what we are talking about is the evolution of DNS zone file management. And in the, in the beginning of DNS, so around 1988 to 1994, most networks were still static. We had large multi-user systems and these don't change often. And these were the systems that were stored in the DNS. Maybe there was one or two changes per month if that was a large network, uh, but mostly it was very static. And therefore the zone files on the DNS service were static as well. And they were managed by the admins with the text editors. And then from uh, 1994 onwards, more and more PC style machines like uh, first MS-DOS and later Windows and Macintoshes and all the other machines that we know and love have been added to the network. Uh, and with that, the networks became more dynamic. Uh, first, there was boot P as the, the earlier protocol to distribute IP addresses to um, machines. And from boot P in an evolutionary, if an, if, well, sorry, evolutionary step, DHCP was developed. Um, and that is what we still use today, DHCPv4 or DHCPv6 to assign IP addresses dynamically to clients. However, that can mean in a busy network, that every machine every day gets maybe a new IP address. And the DNS has to keep up with all this dynamic nature. And uh, we want to have the information in DNS to be on time and accurate. Uh, so the names and the IP addresses in DNS should really reflect what's out there in the network. So to help with that, uh, dynamic updates have been added to DNS because administrators in large networks, they don't want to change uh, hundreds of thousands IP addresses every morning and then um, removing them every afternoon when the machines remove uh, from the network. So with dynamic updates, either the DHCP server or the clients themselves, they can update their name to IP address bindings in the DNS automatically. Then, because if we had now the dyna dynamic DNS updates, the zone file itself changes very frequently, maybe even multiple times in a minute. Uh, imagine a large company with a lot of office PCs. Um, all the, the people come in uh, in the morning to work. Of course, sure, not during this times, so everyone is at home and works from home office, but yeah, in normal times, that was the case that people came to offices and started their PCs. And so all the machines booted up and requested an IP address. And uh, they sent them the dynamic updates to the DNS server, meaning that um, all these changes happening in a very short time. Uh, DNS always had a way to synchronize the authoritative DNS servers, and that is the SOA refresh value. But the refresh value is often sometimes like one hour, two hour, even larger, and uh, it's much too slow in these scenarios. Nobody wants to wait uh, two or three hours until uh, the DNS is working again. So Notify was invented as a way to trigger an almost immediate DNS zone update. And we will cover that in this webinar. But now that zone transfers could occur very often, uh, every time a Notify is being sent out, sending the whole zone, which could have uh, thousands or even millions of resource records in there was quite an overhead. So it would 
waste bandwidth on the network, uh, transferring the uh, full zone every time. So incremental zone transfer or IXFR was invented to send only the differences, the changes since the last transfer. And then from year 2000 onwards, applications started to use DNS as well for the services. Like uh, there was service discovery with the SRV records used in Windows Active Directory, but also Unix-based systems like Free API um, and others. And we have wide area DNS service discovery. We have authentication tokens like the Let's Encrypt information that uh, is being used in DNS or is being stored in DNS. And dynamic DNS is being used in this uh, container discovery. So if uh, uh, containers are launching, they register themselves in the DNS uh, as TXT records, SRV records, A records, quads A records, so that the other services can find them. And also some um, systems use uh, dynamic DNS for server configuration management. For example, the bind nine catalog zones can be used that way. And we will cover that in next month webinar. And integrated network management systems, often called DDI systems for DNS, DHP, and IP address management systems, they started to manage DNS also through dynamic updates. We can think of dynamic updates as the universal API to make changes to DNS content. And the dynamic update stands not alone, it is part of a protocol enhancement that is sometimes referred to DNS IND where the I in IND stands for incremental zone transfers, the N stands for notify, and the D stands for dynamic updates. And the order of this, um, uh, uh, oh, uh, um, sorry, I'm a little bit lost. The, the, the order of the, uh, ah, the, the characters uh, is just the order when the RFCs were, uh, um, specified. So RFC 1995, 96, and 2136. And together, these DNS IND, they allow DNS to handle dynamic updates. It is important to, to, to point out that the dynamic update we talk about here in this webinar is different from dynamic updates that is are used to update uh, some dynamic DNS service in the internet because you are behind uh, a home uh, network ISP and uh, that network ISP changes the IPv4 or maybe even the IPv6, IPv6 address in, in intervals. Now that is a different kind of um, dynamic updates, uh, stuff like the company Dyn uh, is providing. So that's not what we're talking here. We talk about the RFC compliant, the, the internet standard dynamic update. So what are the benefits of dynamic uh, updates and dynamic zones? We can send them over the networks. So there's no need to log into a primary authoritative server to make changes to the DNS zone. We can send them uh, over the network from, from any machine, provided that we can authenticate ourselves against the authoritative server. And how we can do authentication with dynamic updates, we will cover that also in next month webinar. Um, the tools that can send dynamic updates, such as NSUpdate, they check the syntax before sending an update. So it's impossible to create syntax errors in the zone file. You can still create logical errors, but like 50% of possible errors are just gone because it's impossible with tools like NSUpdate uh, to send uh, wrong DNS data, like sending a DNS resource record with a resource record type that doesn't exist. It just wouldn't work because NS update will catch that error and will inform you before it will send the update. Also, another nice touch with dynamic updates is that the source serial number is automatically incremented. Another common error in zone file management is just eliminated here because we don't need to think about that anymore. It just happened automatically. Whenever we do a dynamic change, the authoritative DNS server takes care of incrementing the serial number for us. And if we have DNSSEC secured zones, which we all should have, then the change is also immediately signed. So we don't need to take care of DNSSEC signing. Everything automatic. And 
with dynamic updates, we can script zone changes very easily. And there are even external tools like Let's Encrypt CertBot and others that can make changes to the zone and we can use dynamic updates as an API. And to um, secure all that, we can uh, limit the update function to certain domain names and, and record types. So it's not an all or nothing. We can just enable dynamic updates for certain parts of our zone and keep other parts just uh, um, as um, being managed by just um, the traditional means. So when we talk about dynamic updates, we allow a node, some machine in the network to change the content of the zone. For example, DHCP servers can update the A, quad A and pointer records to reflect the leases they give out. Uh, the IC DHCP can do that, Kia DHCP can do that as well. Uh, client machines can update their DNS information on the authoritative DNS servers. And that is what uh, Microsoft Windows machines do by default. If they receive an uh, DNS, um, uh, an IP address, they try to update the DNS with that information. Uh, and IP address management systems can use that. And also if you plan to write some web front end for your DNS management, then doing that with dynamic updates is much, much easier, much less error prone than to try to let's say parse zone files and parse configuration files on, on a server and make changes there. So uh, what can dynamic updates do? We can add resource records and we can delete resource records. And when we delete a resource record, we have the choice to delete one specific record, or we can delete all the records with a certain type for one domain name. For example, we can say, delete everything dub, 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 example, com, a record, no matter what the IP address is. And if there's just one record of that type, it will be deleted. If there are five records, five A records with different IP addresses, they all are deleted. Or we can even say delete all the records for a certain domain name, regardless of the type. And then all the records with that domain name are gone. There is no modify operation in dynamic updates, but uh, the dynamic updates are transaction based. So how dynamic updates work is that you prepare a transaction that can include multiple update commands. And then that transaction is being executed uh, on the authoritative server as one unit. So when we want to modify DNS data, we first inside the same transaction, delete the old data and then add the new data. And that works just flawlessly. So to prevent anyone in the internet to make changes to our zone file, a dynamic update should be authenticated. And we can authenticate with uh, proper appreciate keys, which are TC keys, or we can authenticate by an IP address. Authenticating with pre keys, with TC keys, it's, it's the much better way and more and more secure than doing that uh, with IP addresses, but it's also a little bit more complex. Uh, we will talk about that in the June webinar. In this webinar, we only look at the IP address authentication. And in order to prevent that DNS update earnestly deletes stuff that shouldn't be deleted or creates a logic error in DNS, it is possible to define prerequisites. So like we can have a prerequisite saying that we want only to add a particular record if there is a different record that already exists or already doesn't exist. And we will look at that also in this webinar. So if we want to send dynamic updates, the sender machine that wants to send the dynamic updates tries to find out the primary server. And most dynamic DNS update tools, uh, they fetch the SOA record and then look at the mname field. And the mname field is the, the master name server, the primary name server, and it will try to send the um, data there. If, um, for some reason, the master name server is not directly reachable. It might be our so-called hidden primary. Then it is also possible to send the update to one of the secondaries and they will then forward the update request to the master. 
to the primary. And here we have a graphic that shows how dynamic updates work. On the bottom, we have the dynamic update DNS client. So that is the machine maybe running NS update. We have on the right-hand side, the DNS resolver that is configured to be the resolver for this uh, dynamic DNS client. And we have two authoritative servers, the primary on the left uh, and the secondary on the right. So our dynamic DNS client wants to send a dynamic update. So it needs to find out where the primary authoritative server for this zone is, uh, is uh, located. So it sends a request via the resolver for the target domain's SOA record. So we want to update uh, a new resource record into the zone. And we see that in the yellow uh, box beside the dynamic DNS client, we want to create the record new.example.com, class internet, record tape A, and then an IPv4 address of 192.0.2.100. So we ask for the SOA record and the authoritative server could be any of the both answering, here it's the secondary, answers now with the SOA record. And the first field of the SOA record is the M name field. And the M name field is the primary uh, authoritative DNS server, the name of that primary authoritative DNS server. In our case, it's ns01example.net. Now we know that name, but we aren't certain that we can reach that machine directly. So in the next step, the dynamic DNS client asks for the NS record set of the target domain. Um, and I have a typo here, it should be example.com. So it asks for the NS records uh, of example example.com NS records. And it um, receives that. And the response here is correct. Example.com has two um, a name server, ns01example.net and ns02example.org, which are the two authoritative servers we see at the top. Now the client compares the name from the M name field in the SOA record with the names on the right-hand side of the NS record set. And if the name in the M name field appears as a host name on the right-hand side of the NS records, then it is a primary that we can directly reach because it is actually an authoritative server that is reachable in the internet. If the name from the M name field does not appear in the NS record set, then it's most likely a hidden primary. And we have to send the update to one of the secondaries and ask the secondaries to forward that request, uh, that update request to the real primary machine. But in our case, we are lucky. We can reach directly that machine. So we now know that ns01example.net is the authoritative server and we can reach it. So our dynamic DNS client now needs the IP address. And that is just a normal DNS uh, name resolution. We ask for ns01example.net A record because that's the name of the primary server for that zone. We get the IP address back. And now we can send the update directly to that machine. The, the primary machine, it checks the authenticity of the client. So it checks whether the client comes with the correct uh, signing key, or if it comes from, the, uh, from a set of correct IP addresses that are allowed to do dynamic updates. And if um, authentication is done, then the uh, new resource records will resource record will be added to the zone. Uh, the authoritative server will increment the serial number and the new record is immediately available in that zone. How do we enable dynamic updates? That's quite simple. In the primary authoritative server, we look for the um, zone configuration block for a domain. And then we add the statement allow update. And we either specify the IP addresses that are allowed to send updates, or we specify the TC keys in the curly brackets there. Like we have that here in the example, allow update 192.0.2.86. And if an update comes from that IP address, 
it is permitted and it is, is accepted. And if it comes from any other IP address, it is being denied and refused. So what happened with the source serial number? Um, every dynamic update that is accepted changes the zone content. And every time the zone content is changing, the source serial number must be incremented. Uh, that is required so that all the secondary servers can use the source serial number to detect updates and to initiate the zone transfers. If the source serial number is not updated, we would have a mismatch between the zone content from the master authoritative server and any of the secondaries. In BIND, we have three different options, how the source serial number is being automatically updated. And we configure that with the serial update method um, which is either in the global option block or is in the zone block. We have the choice of increment, and that's the default. If we don't configure anything special, then the serial number is just incremented by the one every time there's a change. But we can also configure serial update method date, and then uh, bind will use uh, the uh, popular date encoded serial number with four digits of the year, two digits of the month, and two digits of the day, and then two other digits uh, for the changes on that day, where the changes of the day start at zero and they increment for every day. And that is good for 99 changes a day. Possibly if you have a zone that is dynamically updated from clients or from a DHCP server, that might not be enough. Or we can use Unix time, uh, which is then the Unix timestamp, which is the second since 1st of January 1970. And that is then put as the serial number, which is kind of best of both worlds because it's a simple, always increasing number, uh, but it's also um, kind of a date stamp. Uh, it's just a little bit more difficult to, um, to calculate for humans, but it's possible with the date command to convert that back into human readable format. So uh, whenever we change uh, a zone from static to dynamic, uh, that creates a journal file. And the journal file is there to avoid constant rewriting of the zone file. Um, every time a dynamic update is being accepted, that change needs to be committed or written down somewhere so that we don't lose that information in a power outage or uh, a hard server reboot. Um, so bind writes all the changes to what's called the journal file. And that's a binary file in a special format, which uh, is a journal of all the changes of uh, that zone over time. The journal's file name is the same as the zone's file name by default, just with the appendix .jnl. Um, we can change the name and we can even change the maximum size of the journal files um, if we want to, as we see that here in that example. If we don't specify that, um, the name of the journal file is always the name of the zone file with .jnl appended and the max file is just what's um, available on the storage partition. The journal file is being used to recover from a crash. So if uh, bind um, somehow crashes or the whole machine is being shut off or rebooted before bind could rewrite the normal zone file, it will find that there is a journal file and that the journal file contains information that's not yet written into the zone file. And then on startup, it will first write the zone file, which is incomplete, and then it will load the journal file and will merge both together to create the, 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 the good last version of the zone file containing all the dynamic changes that happened before the crash. And then it will write down all that compiled merged information into the uh, proper zone file for next reboot. And if we look at the, the, the journal file, I told you it's a binary file, but uh, there is a tool called named the journal print, 
that we can use to um, print out the contents of that binary file, we will see that it lists all the changes to the zone file in the very same format that is being used for NSUpdate, which is also very nice because uh, we can then even at later time, look at the journal file and see what were the, la la um, the last changes to the zone file and in which order have that changes been made. And if we use uh, timestamped serial numbers, we even have a timestamp when these changes have occurred. Um, everything is being written into the journal file immediately when, a, uh, when an update occurs. And then after roughly 15 minutes after receiving an update, Bind will rewrite the zone file, the text file, um, or show with all the updates received until that uh, time. So on a busy dynamic uh, zone, it's uh, very likely that the uh, zone file is being rewritten every 15 minutes, uh, which shouldn't be a big problem. Uh, unless you host your bind on a Raspberry Pi on an uh, SD card, and that might kill the SD card after time. So be, be careful there um, about the rewrites. If whenever bind rewrites the zone file, the, it, it changes dramatically. Uh, dramatically. So the, the order of the records in the file has been changed, all the comments are gone and all a variable de directives that might have been in the static zone files are gone. So if you care about your carefully written static zone file, you should make a backup copy before you enable dynamic updates on the zone. Very, very important. Um, whenever a zone is dynamic, it's not allowed to make manual changes to the zone file anymore. Um, because there could be uh, uh, an update conflict. So when you make the change with a text editor to the zone file, at the very time, there could be updates coming in via dynamic updates, and there could be a conflict between your manual edits and the dynamic updates, and Bind wouldn't know how to deal with that. So if Bind detects that the zone file has been changed uh, manually or by a script that is outside dynamic update, it will refuse to work with that zone anymore and you have a zone that is just failing and you have to manually um, change that. And we, we I tell you uh, shortly how to do that. Um, there is one way to make changes, manual changes to a dynamic zone. That is by freezing a zone. Um, you do RDC freeze and then you freeze the, the zone. Uh, then you can fire up your editor, make the change, and then you thaw the zone. However, it's much better to um, use NS update and dynamic updates to make changes and not rely on um, an, an editor and manual updates. And even I have a tool for you at the end of the webinar that works with best of both worlds. You can use your editor and still you do dynamic updates. So here's about freezing and thawing. Uh, dynamic zone with RDC freeze and then the zone name, you freeze that specific zone. And while it is frozen, the zone does not accept any dynamic updates. If there are dynamic updates coming during uh, the zone is frozen, they will be refused. While the zone is being frozen, the journal can safely be deleted and you can manually edit the zone file. And once you are finished with changing the zone, um, you should then RDC thaw name of the zone, the zone, so that dynamic updates are enabled again. Whenever you do that, a bind will reload the zone file and it will send out notifies uh, to all the secondaries to inform the secondaries of uh, new changed content. Especially in the um, when, when you have just switched from static zone file management to dynamic zone file management, it can happen that uh, you touch the zone file with an editor and uh, then bind will refuse to load the zone and will refuse to work from the zone. How do you recover from that? There are two options to recover. First option is to stop 
the bind name server completely, which is maybe okay for an authoritative server because um, you should have multiple authoritative servers so it doesn't interrupt the service at all. If it is a hidden primary, that should be no problem at all. You remove the journal file of the defective zone and then you restart the DNS server. On restart, uh, bind will load the zone file and will create a fresh journal file with the changes in there. Or option two, you freeze the zone, uh, you remove the journal file of the defective zone and then you thaw the zone. And then the zone is fixed. So how do we can use, how do we use NS update? Um, NS update is part of the, the bind distribution. It's one of the tools like dig or um, um, NS lookup that um, can be used uh, and is, is part of the bind tools. And NS update works either interactively or non-interactively in scripting mode. Uh, and in both modes, we have one command per line. The, the main three commands are update add for adding new content, update delete to removing resource records from the zone and send to execute the changes. And we can have multiple update adds and multiple update deletes uh, before we do the send. And that will create one transaction with multiple update commands in them. Non-interactively, we can write the commands in a file and we can then fire NS update and specify the file name as a parameter, or we can just pipe the content of the file into NS update. Both works just fine. If we just start NS update without any parameters, we go into the interactive mode and we see the uh, greater sign prompt, and that tells us that NS update is now waiting for commands. The command show shows us the current compiled transaction. In the beginning, the transaction is empty. And you see the, the output here is um, a dig style or DNS style header. Uh, looks very similar to uh, what we see if we do a query with the dig tool. And this is because a DNS update is just a DNS communication. So DNS update packages the ones created by NS update are just DNS messages being sent to the server uh, the same way as DNS queries are sent to a server. So if there's nothing different there. It's UDP or TCP, it's port 53, uh, and it's all in the DNS protocol itself. Next, we create some update ads. Here we um, try to add an IPv4 A record. And if we send an update, if we compile new records in there, we have to specify all the fields except the record class. If we um, just omit the class, it's always class EN for internet. But in the first line of this example, I forgot to type in the time to live for the uh, record. So NS update is explaining that an IN is not a valid number because it expected uh, the TTL there. Then the, the third line, uh, I fixed this. I specified a TTL of 3,600 and all was good. It's also possible to specify a default TTL in NS update with the TTL command and then the uh, TTL value after that. And if we have specified a default TTL, we can then uh, skip an explicit TTL on all uh, later commands like the update at a example.com quad a record with the IPv6 address. And then now the show command shows up that we have two updates in our transaction, one IPv4 address record and one IPv6 address record. And the last command in this example is the send command, which then sends off this um, transaction to the authoritative server. If we want to remove stuff from the zone, we use update delete and that works um, same way. A class again is optional and the TTL um, is also optional. If we provide that it's just ignored because it doesn't really make sense to specify a TTL in a delete because uh, it's, uh, it's yeah, already, the TTL is already in the zone there and we can't have different TTLs for the same record. <clears throat> 
Um, if we provide all the fields except TTL and class, then we delete one specific resource record. If we provide the name and the record type, but without the record data, we delete a resource record set. So we delete all the records of that record type and that name, independent of the record data. And if we just specify the domain name, then we delete all the records, regardless of record type and record data for that name. The update keyword is optional since bind 9.9. .9. So instead of uh, typing update, delete record and update add record, we can nowadays just write delete record and add record. A little less typing. And at the end, once we have compiled our transaction, we type in either send to transmit the updates or we just hit an enter uh, in an empty prompt line, uh, which is the same as send. So be careful here, um, if you compile a transaction, if you type return or enter twice, you immediately send that transaction. Once we have sent the transaction, we can look at the answer, the response coming back from the server with the answer command. And that will tell us the um, starters, which is the important one. And here we see, we have status refused. So for some reason, um, the authoritative DNS server didn't like us to do updates. Either the zone isn't dynamic or we don't have the correct TC key or we're coming from the wrong IP address. I told you that we can define prerequisites for an update. And there are two prerequisites. We can specify a prerequisite annex domain and then a domain name. And that creates a prerequisite for the next command. Here, we require that the domain name in the prerequisite does not exist already. This is here important. We check if the name www.example.com already exists in the zone. And only if it does not exist in the zone, we create a C name because we want to prevent to have a C name and other data error in the zone because the C name can only stand for itself and should not have or cannot have any other record types for the same domain name. And the second prerequisite is the YX domain, which is just the opposite. With prerequisite YX domain, we can check whether the domain name already exists in the zone. Again, in this example, we have a C name where we point web.example.com to www.example.com. And we first check for www.example.com if that exists so that we don't create a C name pointing to nowhere. Usually, NS update can figure out where the um, authoritative uh, primary server for a zone uh, sits. But um, for example, if we have a domain that we want to update that is internal and it's not delegated in the internet, it's not delegated from the root, we can specify the IP address or the domain name of the machine where we want to have this update to be sent to. And that can be done with the server command. So server and then IP address or server domain name will send all the updates to that machine. For IPv6, it's important to define which IPv6 address from the client should be used to send the updates because the IP address should match the IP address configured in some access control lists on the server. And in IPv6, a client usually has multiple IPv6 addresses and uh, some of them could be correct and be part of the ACL and others should, could not be. Uh, and we can control that with the local command, uh, local and then the local IPv6 address that we want to use. And sometimes we have to tell NS update that we want to send uh, a specific resource record into uh, a different zone. And that is important for NS record updates or glue updates because um, glue A and quad A records can live in the zone itself, but they 
can also live in the parent zone. And if we want to update the parent zone, we have to specify that explicitly because by default, NS update always tries to uh, update the, the zone, which is the closest match for the given domain name. So in this example here, updating ns1.subdomain.example.com, uh, NS update would try to send the updates to subdomainexample.com and in order to uh, redirect the updates to the zone example.com, uh, we specify that as a command in the NS update before we compile the transaction. So um, when, whenever we um, have an, send an update and the authoritative server has accepted the update, the zone content will change, the serial number will increment, and then the authoritative server will send a DNS notify message to all its secondaries to inform the secondaries about the zone change. And if a secondary accepts a notify, it will so-called pop the re refresh timer and it will immediately go into a refresh cycle requesting the SOA record from uh, the primary and if the SOA record is higher, which it usually is, then it will initiate the zone transfer. With that, we have almost immediately synchronization or, uh, between our primary uh, authoritative server and all the secondary servers. So a notify is just a, a small DNS message which is sent from a primary server. And the primary server checks um, which servers are secondaries by looking at the zone's NS record set. And it then looks also in the mname field of the SOA record of that zone. And then it will send the notifies to all the machines in the NS record set, which are not in the mname, because the machine in the mname is the primary machine and that already has a change. And the secondary that receives the notify checks that it's a notify for zone, which the secondary is authoritative for, and that the change is coming from the primary server of the zone, and also that the source serial number has been increased. And if then the notify is accepted, the um, refresh of the zone and the zone transfer is then being scheduled. And here we see uh, how the notify works. We've seen this picture before. This is the last step of the dynamic update. And here our authoritative primary server has accepted the update, has incremented the source serial number. Oh, sorry. So here we are. Next, the authoritative server checks for the um, uh, NS resource record set, and there are two authoritative servers in the NS resource record set, ns01example.net and ns02example.org. It finds that ns01 is, is the primary itself, and there's no gain by, by sending a notify to itself. So it deletes itself from the list and then sends a notify to the remaining secondaries, which in this case is just ns02. And that NS02 receives the notify and immediately asks for the SOA record. And then the SOA record is being returned. And now the secondary checks if the SOA record coming from the primary is actually higher than the SOA record that it already has for the zone. And usually it is higher. And if that is the case, it requests an incremental zone transfer. Uh, for example, uh, give me all the changes that happened between the serial number that I currently have and the serial number that, that is the most current one that you have. And then the primary server responds with all the changes, which the secondary then merges into the zone file and both machines are synchronized and have the same zone content. Usually we don't need to configure notify. It's on by default and it works by default. Only if we don't want to have notify, uh, 
we can configure that with notify no, either in the option block for all the zones or in a zone block. We can uh, specify extra targets for notify with also notify. Then a notify message is sent to these IP addresses in addition to the machines that are listed in the NS records resource sec. And we can also do that globally or for a particular zone. And there's also the option to do explicit notify. Here we specify with also notify all the IP addresses that should receive a notify message. And then we configure notify explicit. Uh, and that will only send the notify messages to the IP addresses listed in also notify and will not send notifies to the machines listed in the NS resource record set. And now we have a quick look on incremental zone transfer or IXFR. And with incremental zone transfer, a client, which can be a secondary, can carry just the changes that happened between the previous zone transfer. And that reduces the size and duration of the, the zone transfer. Um, the IXFRs are sent to authoritative servers, not to resolvers, not to caching servers. And if we use bind, then primary and secondary servers, they use IXFR by default. So we don't have to configure something if we want to use IXFR, it's, it's the default. So what happened when an IXFR is being uh, requested? The sender querying the IXFR sends the current serial number, that is the serial number that the secondary owns. Um, so it's like, send me all the changes since this serial number. And then the cleared server responds with all the changes since that serial number. And here we see an example. Uh, first, we see actually the, the updates. So before the updates, the serial number was 2013-08-11-27. And then with NS update, uh, someone added a TXT record with the content Zs into the zone. And if we then request with the dig command, uh, incremental zone transfer with IXFR equals, and then we specify the previous serial number, 2013-08-11-27, we then see um, the incremental zone transfer. And the incremental zone transfer always starts with the SOAR record with the current serial number. It then lists the serial number, um, which is the, the previous, the, the first serial number in the change set, which was 27 at the end in this case. Then it lists the serial number that is after that change, then comes the change. And at the end comes a SOA record with the current serial number again, which is kind of the, this is the end of the zone transfer marker. And with this data, the receiving authoritative name server can figure out what has changed between uh, serial number 27 and serial number 28. It is the TXT record with the content Zs. So here it explains the, um, um, the change uh, in, in detail, but I will skip that because I'm already uh, covered that. Uh, here's an example of what happened if we have multiple changes in an IXFR. So in the beginning, we had the zone at version number two, and uh, then there was one resource record uh, added um, that increased the serial number to number three. One resource record was deleted and two more added in one transaction, serial number now four, then two resource records being deleted, now serial number five. And then at the end, only the SOAR record has been changed and the current serial number is uh, version six. And then we see the order here of the SOAR records and the serial numbers being shown. So it always starts with the SOAR record that has the most current serial number, number six. And then we have the first serial number, number two. Then we have um, the 
different SOAR records that either uh, define that records have been deleted or have been added. That depends on where the SOAR record stands in relation to the data. Uh, so if the um, data comes second, then it's an addition. If the SOAR record comes uh, uh, first, uh, sorry, if the SOAR record comes first, it's an addition. If the SOAR record comes after the data, it's a deletion. And at the end, we have a SOAR record of six, which is then the end of zone transfer marker. The, the, the bind name server uses the journal file that we already covered to compile the IXFR because the journal file contains the changes. If you want to use IXFR with static zones files, you can do so with bind nine, but you have to specify IXFR from differences, yes. Uh, and then whenever you make changes to your static zone files, bind will calculate the differences between the previous zone file and the current zone file and write that to a journal file. So it will actually create a journal file and will use um, that journal file then for incremental zone transfers, which might be useful if you have a large zone where, which still has, um, is still a static zone. So I'm almost at the end of this webinar. I promised you that I tell you how you can still use an editor and um, use dynamic zones. And this is uh, this. Um, I found that um, one reason that DNS administrators don't switch to dynamic zones is because they love editing the zones with their favorite editor. They might even have scripts or macros that help them with DNS zone edits. And they are quite fast with uh, using the their text editors like VI or Emacs or um, even Visual Studio Code or something like that to make changes uh, to DNS zone files. Um, the good message is you can still use your favorite text editor with dynamic zones. However, you can't go onto the authoritative server and just open the zone file with your editor because that will break dynamic updates. Um, Tony Finch, which is uh, a DNS administrator at University in Cambridge in the UK, has written a set of Perl tools that gives you the best of both worlds. So um, you can use dynamic zones and you can edit them with your favorite text editor and you can launch the text editor even on your management uh, desktop machine. Uh, you don't need to log in to um, the authoritative DNS server to do so. Uh, what it does is it, it downloads with a zone transfer of the zone file to the local machine with a text editor. It then creates two copies of that uh, zone file that it has transferred by zone transfer. And it launches the text editor with one copy. You make changes with the text editor to the one copy, you exit the editor, then uh, the tool will calculate the differences, the changes you have made, between the backup copy and the edited copy. It will then create commands for NS updates that recreate your edits with NS update and send these dynamic updates edits to the authoritative zone. The tool is called NSDiff. It includes actually three tools, NSDiff, NSPatch, and NSVI. Yeah, and here's how it works. It uh, does zone transfer. It strips all the DNSSEC records because you don't edit DNSSEC records manually in an editor. Uh, it launches the configured editor, which is VI. If you have, haven't specified anything, or if you have set the editor variable, uh, then it, it launches whatever is your favorite editor. Then you make your edits, you save the zone file, the editor is exited, and then NSVI will uh, check the zone content with namely check zone. So it will prevent typos and, and, and syntax errors. And if there are no errors, it calculates the differences between old and new zone, translates the differences into commands and sends the dynamic updates to the primary DNS server. And that works very, very well. And that concludes today's webinar. Uh, here's additional information, the links to the RFCs dynamic updates, notify, and incremental zone transfers.
And now we enter the uh, first round of uh, questions. But before I will point you to the uh, second part of this Dynamic Zones webinar where we talk about T6 security, access control list with update policy and the grant keyword, and how we can combine dynamic updates and catalog zones to make bind even more dynamic. Uh, meaning we can even then not only add zone content with dynamic updates, we can even add full zones with dynamic updates. Very exciting. If you are interested in that, tune in next month, June 16th. So, but now we have question and answers. We have plenty of questions, Kirsten. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, Let's see, I thought we had one here in the chat, so I'm looking for it. Okay, yeah, so the first question from Andy um, uh, is about uh, comments in Dynamic Zone updates. Uh, is it possible to embed the comments in the, in the update via NS update? No, there are by definition no comments in Dynamic Managed Zones. And uh, if there have been comments in the static zones, and if you turn that zone into a dynamic zone, all the comments will be just gone. Um, just, just basically you can't. Uh, there's no way to have comments in, um, in that. What you can do is you can use resource records uh, for that. Um, for example, you can use uh, txt records or host info or anything like that to write uh, comments into the zone. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, there are several questions about uh, the logging um, uh, for NS update. So uh, first there's been uh, a question about, um, does DNS tap log the NS update tra traffic? Um, I've, I've researched that uh, in preparation for this webinar and the latest versions of DNS tap have that, yes. I don't know exactly which version number and in uh, which implementations of DNS tab have that, but I've seen uh, DNS tab versions that have the updates uh, in there. So that's in the uh, uh, in the DNS tab spec, but uh, maybe not implemented in Bind. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Um, now that is a uh, confusing question. So. Um, uh, a related question from Basker is, um, uh, when does the acts were happened and uh, is that logged? Uh, can you repeat, please? I uh, didn't got oh, the, the beginning. The acts for the, uh, ah, the uh, zone transfer. You know, the, full, the full zone transfer. When, when does that happen and, and how is that logged? Um, that is being logged if, um, if you have, um, configuration, logging configuration to log zone transfers that's being logged. Uh, um, yeah, then wherever you have configured, it should be logged, uh, log file or syslog or something like that. And uh, the IXFR uh, happens uh, either from a secondary when the secondary receives the notify of a change or in case of NSDIF um, that happens before the uh, Editor is launched. So if you call NSVI with the, um, the zone name, uh, then it first does the, the full zone transfer, then calls the editor. So it's happening at the very beginning of that edit cycle. Yeah, I'm not sure because it, it's not completely clear from the question, but um, I know a frequent uh, question is about how can you tell how much time your zone transfers are taking? So not just oh. when does it start, but you mm. know. So between the change and the zone transfer happening, what I do, and that is also in my recommended bind logging template that we had, I think in the very first webinar of this series, um, I write both the notifies and the zone transfer log information into the same file, which is called transfer.log in my template. And with that, you see nicely when the notify is being received or being sent, and when the zone transfer happening, and you see that both on the primary, on the primary you see notify being sent, and then you see zone transfer requested from the secondary. So you see with the timestamps that is usually takes less than a second. Mm 
And you see the same on the secondary, you see notify received and then zone transfer requested in the same file. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a question from Christian. Um, uh, how can the update policy be configured to prevent someone from deleting all the records from a zone? Uh, we cover that next time. I would like to postpone that too, because that's a long answer and we have a full webinar on that. Okay, uh, JP has actually given him uh, some answer in the Q&A okay. uh, chat by commenting. Um, and then uh, uh, this is a good question from Bashar. It's about interoperability. Um, he just is asking, uh, does X for work uh, across different DNS implementations like uh, bind and power DNS or uh, you know, bind and NSD or something yes, like Yes, yes. Um, it's not um, required by the DNS specs that IXFR is implemented. Uh, however, most um, DNS servers that I know that are popular implement that. So power DNS, bind, NSD, Microsoft DNS server, they all implement IXFR and they are interoperable. However, if, um, if, if, if uh, a secondary requests an IXFR towards a primary server that doesn't implement that, the primary will just fall back to a full AXFR that is a full zone transfer. So it doesn't break, it's just not as uh, resource uh, optimized in that case. So it always falls, falls back to a full AXFR if I, IXFR for some reason doesn't work or it's not implemented. 